Cool, cool. Hi, Lillian. Hi, Uncle Jonathan. How's it going? It's going good. I It's rainy, but it's a good day. It looks sunny behind you, but I guess you're just brightening the room as you always do. <laughs> so kind of, kind of rainy. you're done, huh? I'm done. I finished it. Do you have it nearby somewhere? Can I do. Let us? me grab it real fast. Go ahead. So I put it where uh, all the other art stuff. But it's finished. It took me estimate like 15, 17 hours. Uh, and that's based off of all the things that I was watching. But Oh yeah. my God, I can't believe it. So right. that is the entire speech. Yes, this is the entire speech of uh, the Beyond Vietnam speech. So it's the entirety of it. Um, yeah, the whole thing. I don't even, can't even imagine how you did that. No computers, no, you know, maybe, uh, how did you make it fit? Like I would have, I would have gotten to the end and I would have realized that it was too long or too short. Um, well, I have like these pens, like special pens I use called micron pens. And so they come in different, the pen nips come in different sizes. So some are like really small, like the smallest I have is zero, zero point zero zero five. And then the largest one I have is 12. And so that kind of helped with making the small things, but also it was just a lot of like zoning in to one section and then writing really small letters as small as I possibly could, but they're still kind of legible. Um, so I listened to a lot of podcasts and watched a lot of documentaries and stuff um, and just kind of like started zoning out as I was making this. Wow. I still don't think I would have known how to make it fit. You know, like you must have just had a sense for how big to make the words and how much room you had to work with. And what if it was a shorter speech than or a longer speech? Kind of. I mean, I mostly had the speech pulled up on my iPad. Half of my iPad screen had the speech and then the other half has just the photo, the reference photo I was working from. And so as I wrote down uh, different sections of the speech or got through with like different paragraphs, I cross it out um, in the notes doc app that I have. So that way I would know what I already finished and wouldn't repeat any words, hopefully, and things like that and can figure out where it goes. But it's also looking at all the shadows and lights that are on a person's face to figure out what it's what pen tip would work better. You're kind of a genius. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, but you knew that. I felt that way already. You're too modest to agree, but I've felt that way for a long time. So um, while you're reading um, while you're watching podcasts and TV and you're draw and you're doing this, are you able to absorb the words at all? Like, um, first of all, let me ask you this. Um, had you ever heard of this speech before? I knew it was, ex it existed, but I didn't know how long it was. And I didn't really, I haven't really read it before. Um, and I only knew about it because of, um, it sounds kind of bad, like the Selma movie. I have a vague memory. I think they mentioned it in the Selma movie at some point. I'm not too sure, but I had a vague sense that this was a speech, but in school, it's never taught to us. We only learned about Birmingham jail, a letter from Birmingham jail and the I have a dream speech, which everybody knows, but otherwise I had never read or seen anything from this speech, didn't know any quotes, just wasn't on my radar of things. But getting to when I was making it, I'm listening to other things and have like things on the background mostly just so my iPad doesn't fall asleep and it just stays going and I can just keep looking up and it'll be there. But also uh, as I was going through it, I do have to read these speeches as I'm writing them down. And so I got to read, like I got to some points where I was completely ignoring the podcast or whatever I was watching or listening to, or just paused it and just started reading the speech itself. Cause it's very poignant and it was very good speech. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, tell me, let's talk about it a little bit, and I'll tell you why I think it's my favorite of all King's speeches, and I agree with you, I had never been taught it in school either, and and you're a scholar of Black <laughs> history, you've done a lot of uh, work on your own time, um, and certainly in college and everything else, it's, it's, it's sad that we don't teach this one, because I think in some ways, it's maybe his most important speech, but yeah. what was, what did, what, what was your reaction to it? Uh, that's very relevant for a lot of things that are happening today. Like the Vietnam is a very a touchy subject in American history, because when you look at like how it's taught in schools, it's very much taught like, oh, this was like an important war, but it's also never really said what this war was for. Um, I honestly don't know that much about Vietnam, but I do know that also it's taught where people are like, it was a really important war. We did fight it, go our troops. But then on the other half, you have people who are like, we had no business being there. So there's always, there's one side or the other. Sometimes it feels like when you look at the Vietnam, Vietnam war, 
But then with this speech, King is clearly making a statement that he is on the we should not be a part of this. And he's making a lot of good points of the fact that we're sending these black and brown soldiers over there and they're not getting the respect they deserve over here, but we're willing to just send them over there to kill innocent people and to have them come back traumatized. Like it's not okay for us to be doing that. We need to fix stuff at home before we try to fix things in other locations. And so he's very poignant with that, but it also like with today, it goes really well with kind of thinking about like our involvement in the Middle East. It's like, we don't have no business there. Um, Or thinking about just like all the different, like all the conflict that's happening. Um, And he talks about how like, we can't just, just fighting a war for peace will not bring peace and it will just bring more turmoil, which it goes really well with a lot of things of how, um, a lot like with the political parties how people will say like we need to fight or even like the whole argument of uh guns and gun legislation and how we should have guns i went to msu and so we just had the shooting on monday that was really fun for me to um freak out that my friends were maybe killed or shot um and there's this mural at msu called the rock and it's near where my old school was the art school and people just paint the mural paint a mural in there and so after the shooting there was a mural that said msu strong people are leaving flowers it's a very important rock for the university and someone had come along and painted over that and said let us protect ourselves and carry firearms on campus and i understand what they were trying to do but at the same time it's kind of like with this speech where King's like using violence against violence to try to enact peaceful change will do nothing. And luckily that message is now cover up and it honors the three victims of the shooting. Um, But it's, yeah, his whole speech is very poignant for things that are happening today. And you can make like all these different connections. I really wish we taught about it more, Um, but who knows? Maybe we can uh, help promote it's rediscovery with your great uh, drawing. But um, what I love about the speech too, is that it's, it's not just about Vietnam. What he's really saying is that until we deal with our history, until we deal with our, our militarism, until we think about the mistakes we've made, we can never really fulfill our vision and, and, and also his religious vision, right? He's saying one of my favorite lines was he said, the world now demands mature, a maturity of America that we may not be able to achieve. Um, I don't know where that is on your drawing. Um, Probably somewhere like on the cheek, I feel like. I love that. Um, But when he, I thought about that for a while, when he's saying um, we, we demand a maturity of America. And I think what he's saying, I'd be curious to see what you think. I think what he's saying is that we have to be mature enough to recognize when we've made mistakes Mm -hmm. Uh, mature enough to realize that we have a history that we don't have to be proud of that that there are things that we've done wrong and then we can atone for those things and we can move on but if we keep picking fights and if we keep treating other people other nations um the way we treated the slaves the way the enslaved people if we treat them the way we treated people in the 60s when king was around and we we're not getting any better then we're not maturing yeah you're not making any progress just by saying Um, well, it happened and it doesn't matter anymore. And that's like essentially a big part of what I think his speech is trying to say. And what like a lot of activists and myself included are trying to do. Um, As you said, I'm a black historical artist. So all my stuff is about black history, Um, which means I have to look at like the things that are really wonky and kind of messed up about our American history. And I'm specifically doing it for black people, but in doing so, there's not a lot of visual references that I can pull from for that so it's a lot of my trying to figure out what this would have looked like um, as someone who's never lived that experience or dealt with these things and yeah him saying that America has to be mature we're not even mature today uh there's a lot of with like the whole um like congress people who are against CRT and stuff that is a level of immaturity that I think that Dr. King was warning us about you know that's like this it's like putting your fingers in your ears yeah, I so can't they're just hear you. not listening. That's and really mature, listen, right? You're not going to learn or grow. And you can see it with how some people act even today and how they get very frustrated and won't have like civil conversations with a person about history that maybe makes them uncomfortable. It's okay if it makes you uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable to have to read a lot of the things that I have to read in history. I don't 
relish in the fact that I'm learning about how what people who look like me were treated as less than but I understand the importance of doing that um and I think Dr. King he definitely did too but he is trying to just bring to people's attention that if you don't talk about these things if you don't start to look into this history and these problems you're not going to really make any change and yeah you're just going to be a really big immature child for a long time so this speech was april 4th 1967 um and i think a lot of it had to do you know king was really criticized for for talking about vietnam people said stay in your lane dr (laughs) king you know uh, stick to selma montgomery stick to voting rights um but what he said was that you know after going out and seeing the the riots in um Los Angeles and seeing uh, the way he was treated in Chicago, um, my hometown and um, a place that your family has has roots. Um, yeah. um, he felt like he couldn't remain silent about Vietnam. How could he speak out against the violence in in Los Angeles in the riots? How could he if he does if he wasn't speaking out about what he called the greatest perpetrator of of violence in America, the U.S. government? Um, yeah the greatest perpetrator of violence in the world at that time, he said. So it was like this deep philosophical uh, decision for him, right? It much it would have been much more prudent. He would have gotten in a lot less trouble. He could have been much more effective, people thought, if he just stayed uh, with what he was already doing. But it wasn't right. And and he, he was mature, right? He, he understood. He was mature enough to see that it wasn't right and he did have to speak on it. And he talks about it in the speech where he's like, they're asking me why I'm even talking about this and I should just stick to what I know as a minister. Da, da, da. But the thing is like with this speech and with him talking about it and being an activist in general, you do again have to go into places that are uncomfortable for you. And with Dr. King willingly talking about Vietnam, which even at that time is very cont- was very contested and was very, it's still a touchy subject. Even today, there are people who are like, very upset about Vietnam and all these things. Um, And the veterans of Vietnam did not receive the same uh, reverences in the world, but the same like celebration as other veterans of other wars that we fought in, um, just because they were forced to go fight in that war for the most part with the drafts and things like that. But King being willing to speak on it, he is continuing to be an activist and he is being, um, he is essentially spreading the word of God and trying to bring peace and I feel like it's very interesting to see how people to see that how people react react very negatively to that um especially with like a lot of times with war and stuff you say well it's for the greater good or it's for God and he's given us the tools to be able to do this and King is bluntly saying no this is definitely against what the bible is saying and we should be trying to help them and honestly we have no dog in this game because we can't even help ourselves quite yet yeah, and what I love about it is it's really tying together everything he believed in, and he's saying that it was never and and this is painful phone call that we we can read because the FBI was tapping the phones <laughs> of him of his office, his home, and his allies, and there's this painful conversation right after the speech where one of his best friends and advisors says to him, "I didn't like the speech. It, it didn't sound like you. Um, you know, I, I felt like you were." you know, you were reading someone else's words. It just wasn't sound right for you. And King says to his dear friend, um, haven't you known me all along? I've been saying the same thing all along. I'm I'm trying to live the, according to the words, the teachings of Jesus. I'm trying to promote peace on earth. Uh, I'm trying to promote equality and justice. And I'm trying to fight poverty. I've been saying the same thing all along. Haven't you been listening? And this is to one of his dearest friends. It's heartbreaking, but um, here he is in this speech, you know, laying it all on the line, saying, "I don't care what you think of me. This is what's right." Yeah. Um, he knows himself. And one of that goes with like the fact that it wasn't a well-received speech, or even the fact that it was never taught in schools. Is that there is definitely a whitewashing of Dr. King that's happened, um, especially with a lot of eyes. Honest, I say it's both sides, conservative and liberals. Like there's a lot of whitewashing of his legacy where we we do with a lot of historical figures where they're like, ah, oh, they're the end all be all. They are the um like model minority at some point for some of them, or they're just they did no wrong and they were just so peaceful. And why can't you be peaceful 
now? And why are you so violent with all your protests? Um, even with like, I wear this Black Lives Matter shirt. It's one of my favorite ones, but I will still have people even here in New York who are like, Black Lives Matter, that's the, that terrorist group. I'm like, mm, it's really not. I don't know where you got that from. But he was, he was for peaceful protest, but he also understood that like in doing peaceful protest, there is going to be violence. Just because you're peaceful on your side does not mean that the other side is going to be peaceful. As you can see from photos of the civil rights movement where you have police uh, sicking dogs on peaceful protesters or fire hose, even with the uh, freedom riders, how their bust was essentially bombed and all these things. And one of the reasons I recently was reading about like one of the reasons why the Civil Rights um, Act was enacted was because of the three um, activists who went missing, um, the two Jewish activists and the black activists and how they went missing. And because it was two white guys, like Congress was like, okay, maybe we should pass this bill now. But in the search for these three men and trying to find their body, um, like 15 others or something bodies were found and none of them were ever identified um, because they were just black people and it didn't really matter but King kind of saying we shouldn't be in this and condemning this war personally from from not looking past the whitewashing of his legacy this is exactly who he was it makes sense that he would say this it makes sense that he would condemn this and point out to people this is wrong and we shouldn't be doing it um compared to other ones yeah i like what you say about the whitewashing and i think it's really true we talk about the um letter from the birmingham jail and we talk about i have a dream and content of our character but even in even in i have a dream we forget that he called for reparations that he yeah. attacked police brutality we just pick and choose the quotes that we want to use and some of that goes back to the original time when this speech was made because the the white news media most of they the white, pick and choose. They, they picked and choose which quotes they wanted to use but even now we're still teaching the easy parts um, and the parts that don't really push us out of our comfort zone. Yeah, and we should push ourselves out of the comfort zone. Um, and like there, towards the end of his speech, he calls for a positive reevaluation of like the values um, in the way of making the United States better. And when he's saying like, you're going to be uncomfortable having to do this, no one wants to re reassess their values or um, try to figure out how we must not engage with like these anti like these anti communist things that are actually tearing us more apart and making us do terrible acts on the behalf of quote unquote justice. Um, in like him calling out that I when I was reading it I was like yeah we really need to do this again today and calling back out and reevaluating our values and what we what we mean and what we say when we try to support something. Um, he's kind of in a way calling out like uh, performative activism, which I really enjoy, especially as someone who sees a lot of performative activism. Like I'm on social media, I have TikTok, I see it all the time where people are just really performative and being like, ah, oh, I'm totally an activist or hashtag Black Lives Matter. But like they're not doing the things that they should. And I also see this as someone who's a museum educator and museums are a great example of institutional uh, like disenfranchisement disenfranchisement or injustice or racism and just how museums in America specifically were built and a lot of times I have to call out museums that I've worked at and say you are being performative with your activism one of the museums I worked at they were very insistent that they were meeting their uh my diversity quota and social justice and action quota by only collecting from people who had been incarcerated or only having exhibitions about mass incarceration specifically for brown and uh black and even women um populations which yes we do need to talk about mass incarceration that is a problem but when that is the only thing you look at or how a lot of museums when they talk about black history they will talk about the trauma of black history and the sad things that is performative um black history is not all sad it's actually pretty cool and pretty fun uh but a lot of people you have to call them out and for that museum i had to call them out and it's like you know you can do more for talking about like BIPOC experiences than just talking about mass incarceration because not all of us went to jail know someone who went to jail or have gone to jail that is a stereotype um they didn't realize that and then I left so I did not help them with that unless they want to pay me for it but 
it's one of those things where his speech, like I said, just had a lot of, there were a lot of points where I was like, this is important and this is important as I was reading through it. Yeah, it's a long speech and you can tell that from your drawing, uh, but it, it covers a lot of ground and, and it, and it you know, it's really proposing a revolution in values. It's proposing that we think differently, be better and and just stop and ask ourselves if we're if we're on the right track. And I think he's saying that we're not, that that we're, you know, we're becoming more cynical. We're becoming more um divided and um I, I i i shudder to think you know what he would say if he saw where we are today but he's giving us a roadmap in this speech so i'm going to try to let's let's wrap this up on a positive note like yeah. did this did, did reading this speech and, and writing it out um and spending all these hours with it did it um did it give you any any hope yeah i mean i it, it made me gave me hope of seeing that like this isn't just a new thought that a lot of people have of like, we need to reevaluate that this has been a thought. And he took the time to write a very well thought out speech that talks about this. But at the same time, it made me think about, I work with kids a lot. I work with itty bitties, which is like zero to six um, for me. And they are very thoughtful children about these things. We have to have conversations in the art museum about like, well, how did this piece get here? If it's from China and like, 2000 years old i have be like okay well people took it um that's not to say that it's stolen but it was at one point and kind of talking to the kids about that but they have a lot of um they're like reevaluating things even with the teens that i work at work with at the museum um the teens are definitely like the newer generation alpha or whatever they're called they are definitely showing me that they even if they haven't read King's speech, which I feel like if they did, they would take this and run. But even if they haven't read it, that generation, the younger generation is definitely reevaluating things. And even my generation as a millennial, um, as we are slow, more so being seen in like Congress and the Senate and the House and all that stuff, we are also taking these things into consideration and calling for that big reevaluation. So I feel like it took a while, but in general, I feel like a lot of people in America are starting to do what he's saying in the speech, which is just reevaluate ourselves and figure out, is this really what we want to be? And are we really that mature or do we have some growth to go? So it was a very cool speech. I definitely have been telling all my friends about it as I've been working on it. Um, Cause none of them knew about it, of course, as well. Um, and I feel like if I had read this, like when I was in school and reading Birmingham, jo the letter from Birmingham Joe, or even I have a dream, I, I was bored with those speeches just because I heard so much about it. And I was like, I don't want to read this again. It seems boring. I don't really care. Um, but this one, I was not bored with it. And I feel like if we read it in schools, I think more kids would do what he's saying and use his actual roadmap. That's awesome. So get the sticker and read yes. the sticker with a magnifying glass, then go yes. read or just read the speech as you admire the sticker on your laptop. Maybe read my book too if you feel like it. And <laughs> it's a um, book. and I wanted to say that you know you, Lillian, and your sister and my children give me hope that uh, <laughs> we we can mature even if my generation hasn't matured very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks again, Lillian. I'm so happy to uh, have been a part of this, and I can't wait to get my sticker. Yes, I can't wait to get my book. <laughs> All right, it's a deal. Bye. Bye.